When day turns to night, and the moon is hidden from sight, shed the king of you and wear the queen. The nine realms will open and your magic be free. Hi everyone, it's your favorite drag witch, Nova Jupiter Jenkins, or at least I'll be your favorite once you get to know me. My friends call me Nova JJ, and you can too. If you're just tuning in, you might want to go back and listen to the previous episodes to get caught up on this sitch with this witch. Oh my goodness, I almost didn't survive my last book hunting expedition. Before I dive right into story time with my near-death experience, as you can see, or not see as might be more accurate, I'm back here on the new moon, which means everything is dark. The August new moon is known in this part of the heath as the Dragon Tongue Moon. Named so because most fire-breathing species of dragon are born with a protective layer on their tongue that starts out white, but is blackened as they begin to breathe fire. And of course, August feels like scorching dragon's breath. There is a certain dragon-obsessed culture who believes that the moon actually is a dragon's tongue, and that a new dragon is born and learns to breathe fire throughout the moon's cycle. They believe that the fire is so hot that it's not visible to the average eye, and that one day all the moon dragons will gather and destroy us all in a searing apocalypse. (laughs) They're a fun bunch. Okay, story time. Bear with me while I lay some groundwork. Let me go back and start from what could be considered the beginning, or a beginning. It starts with Adam back in Mundania. Before he discovered that he could tap into his power by turning into me and traveling to the Heath, the one magical area he wasn't lacking in was dream work. He didn't realize it at first, he just thought he had wild and adventurous dreams. It really wasn't until I came along that I... He re realized the scope of his dreaming ability. Looking back, one of the indicators of his dreaming status was the fact that he suffered from sleep paralysis and night terrors. Science would have you believe that these phenomena are purely physiological, uh, but that's not the whole picture. It's actually caused by an attack from a hagubus, more commonly referred to as a succubus. In the context of a succubus, they're pictured as beautiful, nubile women. But when they're attacking someone who wouldn't be susceptible to the charms of a naked woman, such as a child, a straight woman, or a gay man, they generally, though not always, appear in their natural form, which is a hag. They're a kind of psychic vampire that feeds on the energy of unsuspecting slumberers. I prefer the term hagibus, because I'm tired of everything revolving around a straight man's perspective. And even when they're evil, badass hags shouldn't be minimized. Sleep paralysis affects children more often because hagibi find their essence is pure and unencumbered by the crushing realities of mundane adulthood and the programming inherent in modern society. It's like their version of eating organic. It's also easier to extract their favorite flavor, which is fear. Their next favorite meal is untrained witches. There's a lot of delicious psychic potential, but little defense. Adam was fairly young when a particular hagibus by the name of Lilt found him to be a tempting morsel she couldn't ignore, so he hadn't really had any education yet. She found him an easy meal at first, but every time she came back she found him stronger and less prone to fear, since he found dreams, even nightmares, more fascinating than frightening. It didn't take long to figure out that he wasn't going to continue to be the easy meal he had started out as. His proclivity for dreaming afforded certain natural, or in this case supernatural, defenses, By this time, Lilt was addicted to his particular flavor of energy, though, so instead of giving up, she employed, or tried to employ, trickier tactics. She started out by taking the shape of allies in his dreams. She knew better than to take the form of immediate friends and family, as Adam would sense something was off right away, so she appeared to him as the significant other of a family member, or someone equally removed but still more trusted than a stranger. Adam saw through this anyway, 
So Lil changed her focus to invoking fear as an invisible entity who would physically attack Adam during some of his more vulnerable dreams. This mostly just pissed Adam off, and feeling backed into a corner, he attacked the Hagibus, doing some serious damage. So she retreated to lick her wounds. Adam slept so much better after that. But where do you think beings like her retreat to? You guessed it, the Heath. Not only that, but guess who has a tendency to check books out of the library and not return them? Without even making the connection, since I didn't know the name of the Hagibus who had attacked Adam at this point, I'm out hunting for this book, Dreamwalkers and Their Weaknesses, A Guide to Feasting on the Unconscious Warrior. There I am, mucking through the swamp, nearly ruining my dress, my boots, and my hat. My feet are freezing, and I can feel the mud squishing into my boots. So I come across this little hut with a small fire burning outside the entrance. And next to the fire is the hag. Her hair hangs down in front of her face, so I still don't make the connection. Until she looks up and I see the bite mark that Adam left on her cheek. I guess technically, in modern corporate or political terms, this would be considered a conflict of interest. But we don't really have that here, so I was definitely interested in this conflict. Now, for the record, I did make an attempt to retrieve the book in all civility. I said please and everything. And you know what I got for my trouble? She sicked her shadow men minions on me. Or tried to. Hugo and Munzee needed some exercise, so they took the shadow men for a little run. Well, parts of them anyway. I think the shadow men can survive dismemberment. Or they could have if the hag who had bound them into servitude had remained intact. As a witch, I normally have a rule against burning anyone alive, but I also believe in not being wasteful. I mean, the fire was already lit, and she was going for my face, and remembering years of Adam being attacked may have removed any restraint I might otherwise have shown. Also, it happened so fast, when I blocked her initial attack, she landed in the fire, and Haggy by her more flammable than you'd expect. Uh, Now my hair is all smoky. But don't worry, people, for the ethical treatment of Hagibai or Peth. It's not like she's dead dead. It takes more than that to kill a Hagibus. She'll be back, and she'll be pissed. But hopefully she'll leave Adam alone, and can remember to return her library books on time. On a somewhat related note, I wanted to send a shout-out to all the crones out there who aren't evil soul-sucking entities. Women of advanced age, whether historically, mythologically, or currently, are valuable members of the human experience, and too often society is quick to discard them or to shut them away. We owe so much to the women who have lived through all the phases of maiden and motherhood to reach that of crone. We need to honor and celebrate them. Thanks be to the crones, and blessed be. Right, it's tarot time. So, in the honor of the Dragon Tongue Moon, we're going to use the Dragon's Riddle spread. You've heard the expression, life is a dragon and then you die. Well, in this spread, life is a dragon, and during the dark of the new moon is the best time to descend into the dragon's lair. Confront some of the darker, scarier aspects of life. And if you can best the dragon, one way or another you might walk away with a valuable prize. Of course, there are risks involved, so venture carefully. The first card in the spread is the riddle itself, the initial challenge that the dragon has for you before you can even enter the cave. This card doesn't indicate what the riddle is, because it will be different for everyone, just what it represents. The dragon isn't challenging just your entry to her lair, but also your assumptions about the world in which you exist. The riddle is asking you, what has brought you to this life? What is your purpose? And how does it relate to how you've lived your life to this point? The card coming up is the Emperor, the card of order and logic. When solving the dragon's riddle, you'll need a logical detachment. In other words, you'll need to invoke a dragon's perspective. Look at the big picture on the dragon's timeline and think through each aspect of the riddle in terms of how a dragon would see it. 
Of course, you might say, well, thinking through each aspect of the riddle logically is just how you solve riddles, but that's not always the case. The main point, though, is that you cannot let fear be part of the process. Facing the dragon is a frightening prospect, but success depends on being able to detach from fear, take control of your emotions, and handle the riddle with confidence, whatever it may be. The next card is the first of three potential prizes you could win from the dragon, and that is the dragon's wisdom. This is no small boon, but its value may not be immediately apparent upon receiving it, since it comes from the same detached, big-picture perspective as the riddle itself. Not that any of them are easy, but this is the easiest of the prizes, as those who solve the riddle and are content with the wisdom the solving provides can leave the dragon in peace and continue on their way forward, all the wiser. The card coming up here is the Two of Wands. This card represents dominion, strength, and courage. It's saying that once you know and are able to answer the riddle that the Dragon of Life has posed to you, you will have the strength and courage to take dominion over your own destiny. Now for those who can't solve the riddle, or who are not content with just the Dragon's words and want to see what other prize they might win, you must battle the dragon itself, and so the next obstacle to overcome is dragon fire. Once the dragon sees that you do not intend to continue on your way, it will spit fire at you. And the card here is the Page of Wands, but it's reversed. This means that the fire you have to face will be the superficial, unstable, and cruel people of the world, the ones who refuse to examine themselves or the world around them in too much depth. They are blind to their own potential and want to make sure that you stay blind to yours. They let themselves be controlled by the dragon and resent the possibility that you are free. If you get caught up by these people, their petty and selfish fire will consume you. Now, if you're able to avoid the flames and get closer to the dragon, you will have the opportunity to snatch a second prize, which is a piece of the treasure that makes up the dragon's hoard. By nature, the treasure will have a discernible value, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's worth the dragon's wrath, for it's not just on the approach that you'll need to worry about the flames, but on the retreat as well. The card coming up for the dragon's treasure is the Three of Cups. This is a card of parties, celebration, and merriment. As you may remember, the suit of tarot that represents material wealth is that of pentacles, so the fact that we have a Cups card coming up here instead indicates that if you risk the flame, dodge the shallow a-holes with monetary gain in mind, you'll have success of a sort, but it won't necessarily last. You'll enjoy the good times, and the wine will flow, but it will run out, and you'll be left with empty cups. In this sense, the hoard treasure, or the temptation of it, is really an obstacle disguised as a prize. To achieve the ultimate prize, you'll need to solve the riddle, Dodge the fire, resist the treasure, and get past the dragon's last two defenses, her teeth and her scales. For the teeth card, we have the chariot, and for the armor card, we have the four of wands, reversed. The chariot is a card of travel, and the four of wands reversed is a card of instability and conflict. So the two cards combined signify being driven beyond your control into unstable and conflicting situations. So no matter how much control over your world that you may have gained from the dragon's wisdom, outside forces will have other plans, and those unpredictable forces will threaten to devour you. But if you can endure with courage and strength, maintain the ability to detach and examine yourself from the long game perspective, and resist the temptation for fleeting gratification, you can slay the dragon and obtain the ultimate prize, the dragon's egg. At this point, you have conquered the dragon that is life, and will now have your own dragon to raise according to your riddle. The card coming up here is the Ace of Cups. This is the card of contentment, nourishment, and abundance. So whereas the Three of Cups earlier represents fleeting happiness, this card represents a deep, long-lasting contentment in abundance. Okay, there you have it. Please note that no actual dragons were harmed in the course of this tarot reading, and I do not condone violence against dragons, except in the extreme circumstance of self-defense. All 
All right, we've received a new dream this month. This one comes from Jen in Moncton, New Brunswick. Jen writes, I was part of a group of people who were going to colonize Mars. We were going in separate colony groups, but everyone was launching at the same time. Each group would launch at a different vector, so each group's arrival would be staggered by a year or more. Someone in the colony group who was arriving after mine was upset. I'm not sure if it was about the staggered arrival time or something else. The silo towers that the colony ships were attached to were orange. Hmm. That's an interesting one. I have a feeling... Let me consult my pendulum on this one. Oh, fascinating. I was a little off. So I originally thought this might just be a vision of the future. But in this case, it's a vision of another present. There's a version of you in an alternate reality where the advancement of technology wasn't held back by political, religious, and capitalistic squabbling, who actually is about to travel to Mars, and they're so anxious that it's spilled through the vibrational barrier that separates you. The best thing I can suggest is to wish your alternate self a bon voyage. Visualize them having a safe trip and a happy life at their new home. Thanks for writing. Well, I hope you enjoyed the Dragon Tongue Moon episode, everyone. If you did, tell a friend or two and share us on social media. Send me an email at novajj at novajj.net and rate, comment, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you might find us. And remember, if a messiah is going to die for your sins, you have to call no take-backsies first. Bye.